David Martin MMA fighting here with the legend, the icon, the Hall of Famer, and PFL broadcaster now, Randy Couture. Randy, welcome back. How is everything? Very, very good. Thanks. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So, Randy, we are in the middle of a uh, very busy PFL season right now. Uh, I assume you're in quarantine. <laughs> We're a day away now. Uh, how is everything, man? Have you been enjoying the fight so far this season? Oh, it's been amazing. Great fights this season. Really excited about tomorrow night's fights. Uh, Weigh-in show today coming up in about an hour. Well, a couple hours, actually. But uh, I got in last night to Atlantic City. Uh, thankfully, I'm in the red zone, so I don't have to quarantine quite as <laughs> much the athletes have to quarantine. <laughs> these days yeah absolutely um one of the biggest storylines coming out of pfl this season has been some of the surprises you know we talked earlier before the season started about some of the big signings uh that that pfl was making you know anthony pettis rory mcdonald fabricio verdum uh you know some of the big signings that we've actually seen a lot of upsets anthony pettis ends up losing his first fight marcine held pulls off the upset against natan schultz which i think shocked a lot of people uh you know there's been a lot of that i mean have you been i I guess impressed or surprised by some of the some of the upsets we've seen absolutely surprised i think uh you know i I don't think i would have uh in a million years seen the the Nathan Schultz fight go the way it did. Uh, I, I mean, Held is relatively, or Hamlet rather is relatively, or no, it's Marcin Held. I keep, <laughs> I keep mixing up Hamlet and Held. Uh, the, the, you know, unpredictable. We don't know that much about him. Uh, amazing competitor. Expected him to go out and try and get, get to the submission and get to the ground. And man, he just threw punch after punch and combinations at, at, and Nathan, uh, you know, the, the Bubba Jenkins, Lance Palmer fight was, was surprising to me. I, you know, I, I knew Bubba was a great wrestler, national champ from Arizona state, but I did not expect him to take Lance down and control Lance the way he controlled Lance. Obviously the Pettis collared fight was amazing fight. Collard did an amazing job letting those boxing hands go with amazing precision and, and great power. Uh, I think that surprised Pettis as well as everybody else watching that fight. It was, it's been a crazy year. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. I, I was talking to Ray Sefo yesterday and I said, you know, we got a couple of key fights coming up because, and again, obviously I, you know, I wish nothing but the best for the returning champions, but we're in a scenario now where depending on what happens next week, we could see the playoffs start without Natan Schultz and without Lance Palmer. And Lance Palmer's in a situation where he has to get a first round or a second round finish to even get in the conversation to make the playoffs because of where featherweight's at right now. So it's kind of a crazy season when you think about two of the most dominant champions they have are right now on the bubble of not even getting in the playoffs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think they're both in win or go home scenarios, uh, which, which is crazy to me that two, you know, back to back champs and, and to be in that circumstance, you know, we saw Emiliano Sordi who, who almost had a perfect season in 2019, struggle a bit in, in his first outing. So I'm excited to see him compete and see how he does tomorrow. I think we're going to see a little bit different Emiliano tomorrow, but uh, uh, man, amazing. Some amazing fights. Uh, Fabricio Verdum, obviously uh, getting a no contest and a very conter- con- con- controversial stoppage. Uh, and he, that puts him under the, under the gun too. He's got to have a finish coming into his last fight to make it to the postseason. So Absolutely a crazy season so far. Absolutely. One of the uh, the other aspects I've been enjoying this year is the uh, the broadcast team has expanded. You've been working with your old pal Kenny Florian has joined the team this year. And I got to say, you're Randy, you've been doing commentary for a long time, and 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 Kenny has been too. But I got to be honest, uh, the thing that has surprised me most about the broadcast team uh, last year and this year is Sean O'Connell. I mean, goodness gracious, doing play by play is not easy. I don't think people understand how difficult play by play is. He has he has quickly become one of the best play by play by play guys in the sport. I agree hundred percent. He does an amazing job, and and let's be honest, that's the heavy lifting in the broadcast booth. Me and Kenny get to smile and and, and give you color and kind of highlight what we see as fighters that maybe a lot of people don't recognize. But Sean is doing all the ins and outs for every segment, and he just does a great job. And that is not an easy job to do. Yeah, how has it been working with Kenny this year? Kenny's great. It felt seamless. Uh, very comfortable. Obviously, I've, I've known Kenny since all the way back in Tough One. Uh, he, he knows the sport as well as anybody. Um, so, and, and it just feels very comfortable working with Kenny and Sean. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the big things, one of the big topics that's come up over this last week, and obviously uh, you knew we were going to talk about it, was Clarissa Shields making her debut last week. The world was watching, and, and I know everyone was interested in your commentary because, of course, you had the experience with James Tony, famously the boxer who yep. attempted to cross over. I was at that fight. I remember being there for that fight. Uh, Clarissa had some struggles. I mean, she obviously had some struggles those first couple of rounds. She came back, and I think I, I saw today, like, after the fight, I think she said she told you, I'm not James Tony. Uh, <laughs> so what what was your what was your reaction to, uh, to Clarissa's performance? Well, first of all, hats off to Clarissa for willing to – being willing to put all that, all those accolades and, and all of that to the side and foray into, you know, a new sport. Um, I, I think that's pretty admirable and, and she's done a great job. She absolutely got in big trouble with, with Brittany Elkin in the first and the second round. I mean, literally got in the worst position you want to be in as a boxer or a striker and that's full mount <laughs> for most of both of those rounds. So she stayed composed. She's resilient. She listened to her corner. She managed to turn it around in the third and get on top and drop some very heavy hands on top of Brittany to win the fight. Uh, I was impressed with her. She did uh, say, I'm, I'm better than James Tony. I'm not James Tony after the fight, which I thought was hilarious. I made the joke after the first two minutes that she's already done better than James Tony. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but she also said, man, uh, that girl had me in trouble had no idea how how good she really was until she got me in those situations and i think she recognizes that she still got a lot a lot of work to do to be a full well-rounded mixed martial artist yeah when you came into mma you know obviously it was a, it was a different time in the sport but when you came in you had that wrestling background wrestling i think in my opinion is the single best base for mixed martial arts i think wrestling or wrestlers in general adapt the quickest because they have that one weapon that you just can't you just can't learn in, in six weeks or eight weeks or ten weeks or anything like that. Uh, and and Kayla Harrison with judo, she had a, a similar skill set with the takedowns and the submissions and things like that. Boxers are not in that position, and kickboxers to a certain degree. I have, uh, we've seen some kickboxers have struggled as well. Do you feel like the learning curve with with Clarissa is going to have to be a lot bigger than maybe what some people are expecting right now? Well, in my experience, it seems like the grapplers tend the way they learn and the way they look at things tend to learn the striking side of our sport much quicker and much easier, at least enough to be proficient to get people where they want to get them and going the other way from the striking realm. That seems to be a lot tougher to develop that mad sense, to develop that innate kind of sense of where you're at in the grappling realm uh, for strikers going the other way. It's been a lot tougher. Obviously we've seen Kayla Harrison do an, do amazing uh, in able, you know, in the striking and, and in mixed martial arts as she transitioned from a two-time judo gold medalist. And now Clarissa's on the other side of that same coin as a two, two-time gold medalist in boxing, trying to come the other way, learn the grappling, learn the wrestling situations. I just feel like that's going to be a little slower go than we've seen Kayla. And we're all excited to maybe at some point see these two match up, see these two in the finals or, or in the competition. So We'll see how long that takes. I think Clarissa is very diligent. She's put herself in a great camp and a great place to be able to learn what she needs to learn to take advantage of her boxing background, but it's going to take a minute. Yeah. She's really humbled herself though. I know from talking to her, you know, she didn't come in day one thing and she was going to wreck people. I remember I'll never forget interviewing James Tony when he was going to fight you. And I remember talking to him and he just like, I, I was like, I kind of had to like trying to wrap my head around him. Like everything was just about, I'm going to knock him out. He can't deal with my punching power. And I'm like, great. Hey, can you deal with his wrestling? Can you deal with his, his <laughs> take downs? Can you deal with his submissions? Like he just thought he was going to come in and be a boxer and be one of the greatest mixed martial artists of all time. Obviously, we saw that fight played out. Clarissa has humbled herself. She has taken, you know, she has admitted she didn't know what she needed to know going in day one. And I think that's a big difference. She seems fully committed to this. Absolutely. And, you know, rubbing elbows with Holly Holm is not a bad thing. There's a gal that also has a strong striking background that made that transition, learned all the other things she needed to learn from about MMA to, to be successful. So I definitely think Clarissa is in the right place. She's with the right people, you know, Greg Jackson and company. Um, and I think she's going to keep working her butt off until she gets where she wants to be. Yeah. It's funny because we've always, you know, right now, and I, and I know you've seen this Randy in the sport where we're at, 
that we're in this weird time where we've seen a lot of mixed martial artists crossing over to boxing. And and listen, I'm never going to fault anyone for making money. You know, I mean, uh, you know, there's no no problem making a paycheck, but it's we've seen that. But we keep seeing the other side. They're like, come over and fight us here. Come over and fight us in MMA. And you don't see nearly as much willingness. Like, let's say Jake <laughs> and Logan Paul. They don't seem like they're jumping at the chance to come over and fight MMA as much as they're inviting Tyron Woodley and Ben Askren to come box them. Yeah, and interesting that that uh, Jake Paul wants to choose guys with wrestling backgrounds and not solid striking backgrounds to compete against in boxing. I'm waiting for the the real boxer, the real striker that steps up and makes that fight happen because I think Jake's going to get a big a big awakening. Um, wow. I, I I think Tyron's up to the challenge. He's a diligent guy. He's got a, he's he's hooking up with some great boxing coaches. He's got plenty of time. To, to sharpen the striking tools. He's an amazing athlete. So I have high hopes for Tyron. I think it was ill-advised for Ben. Ben was never a, a very powerful striker in the first place. His wrestling credentials stand on their own. Um, you know, coming off a of hip surgery and all the other stuff that led into that fight. Great for him getting a paycheck like that. I mean, he's never been paid that well in MMA. And, uh, and I think that that's the one thing that's happening is these guys are shining a light on the spar- the disparaging difference between pay in boxing versus MMA. Yeah, let me let me ask you about that, Randy, because I, I was going to bring that up because Jake Paul, one thing, whether you like the guy or not, you know, he's he's brought that up. You know, guys coming over to make a big payday against him. Tyron Woodley, I talked to Tyron's manager, and he flat out said he's making the single per single biggest purse of his entire career. And and when you think about that, that's a five time defending UFC champion. And that's not what you want to hear that he's making more money in his first ever boxing match than he ever made in in his career, you know, in the UFC. Um, And listen, you know, we we've known about this for years. You battled for this for years in terms of, you know, better contracts and fight. Like, what do you make? Do you feel like we're finally seeing people kind of wake up to this or I don't know. Cause I know we've had this discussion for years, but. Yeah. You know, I think, the, the guy that really had a chance to shine a light on it was Conor McGregor. And he, he got a boxing license. As soon as he got a boxing license, he rendered his UFC contract null and void. He had the protections of the Muhammad Ali Act when he became an official boxer with that boxing number. And, and he chose to bring Dana White and company back into that fight when he could have done all that on his own, kept all that money to himself and shine the light on the problem in the sport of mixed martial arts. He chose not to do that. Now, he made $100 million off of that fight with Floyd Mayweather. That's more than he'll probably ever make in mixed martial arts, to be truthful. So I think it started there. I think really the, the first big red flag was selling the company for $4.2 billion. That's when a lot of fighters stood up and, and said, what the heck? How in the heck is that possible? And, uh, and then Connor, I think, again, shined a light on it, but chose not to pursue it, chose not to highlight it and, and try to improve our sport. Now I think you got guys like Jake Paul. Why is Jake Paul the one to step up and poke Dana and, and shine a light on what's going on and the difference between our sports and, and what the Ali Act does for boxers that doesn't happen for the rest of us in combative sports? I think that's what needs to change. You know, if it takes Jake Paul to, to run his mouth and get that done, then great. Uh, how, as long as it gets done, but I don't know. It's, it just seems kind of crazy to me that it's coming from there and that we as athletes in mixed martial arts can't, can't come together and can't hold these promoters to a higher standard and create the transparency that we need in the sport. Absolutely. And I know the Ali act has been, you know, there's been so much, there was a lot of controversy with that over the years and getting that through. But I know that's been a, a passion project for a lot of people, you know, getting that because the, you're right. Transparency is the problem. There isn't any, uh, yep. you know, it's just like, even now, uh, even though they weren't ever fully reported numbers, like now commissions aren't even reporting salaries anymore. And that like, that's a weird one. Like that used to be at least some, some small insight into like, the prelim guy on the first five of the night getting paid, you know, five grand or whatever. At least we had yep. that. Now we don't even have that. So it's like, we are actually getting less information than we used to get. Yeah, it's it's crazy to me. And I mean, how are you supposed to negotiate your true value in an event, in a, in a sport, when, when you don't know how much revenue you brought in competing on that event and that show? It, it's pretty tough. So and then you throw the ancillary rights and all the other stuff that they're trying to take away from these athletes. It's, it's a kind of a ridiculous situation that needs to change for sure. I know this is such a broad subject, Randy. And I'll kind of get off the subject on this one. I'll ask you, like, 
what do you think it's going to take to make a change? Like, is it going to be the Ali Act? Is it going to be, you know, guys like Connor? And we've seen John Jones. I mean, John Jones has been fighting for it, and he's still fighting for, you know, getting better pay for him to come and come up to heavyweight. What is it? What What do you feel like is it, is it going to take to finally make at least some small change? Well, I think there's three things going on. The first is is obviously the class action lawsuit that, you know, is the long play. It's going to take a while to settle all of that. The affidavits are in. It's been certified as a class. If they're successful in proving their case, it's going to force the biggest promotion anyway in the sport, the UFC, to, to do business differently. That's that's the first scenario. The second scenario is the MMAFA, the Mixed Martial Arts Fighters Association, and I'm part of that group, have been lobbying to see the Ali Act amended, just change the definition from boxer to mixed martial arts or combative sports athlete. And then we would enjoy the same transparency and, and restrictions on promotions and promoters that boxers have been enjoying since 1996. Now, the UFC is lobbying very, very hard and spending a lot of money to keep that from being voted on. It's gotten us tossed out of the Energy and Commerce Commission, which is where it was originally voted and, and voted in. So they're doing their thing to try and keep it from being a vote um, and voted on. Uh, the third thing is organizations like the PFL that have taken this sport and put it in a regular sports format are paying the athletes very, very well. You know, a million dollar purse at the end of each season with a new champion. I think that's another avenue as well. They're creating a, an athlete's advisory board and doing some things that some of the other promotions aren't doing. And that's, I think that's a third potential to see change in the sport. We're obviously attracting a lot of big names and top names from the sport that, that want a shot at that money and want a chance to know when their next fight is going to be and, and not have to worry about it. So I think those are all three things that are a positive change in our sport. It's it's funny. I was joking with Ray Sefo yesterday. We were talking about Kayla Harrison, you know, maybe not getting the respect she deserves in the quote unquote pound for pound rankings. And we were talking about that. And I said, you know what, though? I said, at the end of the day, pound for pound rankings are great, but she's going to, she went home with a million dollars in her, in her last tournament. And she may go home with another million dollars this year. And I said, you know what, that's better than any ranking next year. And going on with $2 million to make, because I guarantee that's more than the average fighter is making in, in most promotions. You know what I mean? Absolutely true. I think that's absolutely true. Well, uh, Randy, this season has been, has been crazy. And uh, man, you've been doing great in the commentary. I, I gotta be honest, you know, uh, commentary teams are a big deal in MMA. And I think you, Sean and Kenny have really been a, a great team. I really enjoy the commentary this season. It feels like you guys have found a real good chemistry this year, uh, hearing you guys call the fights. I mean, I know you've been doing it for a long time, but you know, as well as I do, some teams don't work as well as others. And, uh, I think you and Ken, you and Kenny and, uh, Sean have become a fantastic commentary team for the PFL now. Thanks you, man. I appreciate that a lot. It, it feels really comfortable. It's felt comfortable right from, from the jump, right from day one. So it, it's been fun to be involved. We have fun. We, you know, we're, we're joking around, but we're also, you know, I, th I think uh, very happy to be involved with the PFL and seeing what they're doing and, and seeing these athletes come to life. And I know you're in Jersey now. Now you have history with Jersey, of course, as a fighter. Are you excited to, uh, to do the playoffs down in Florida, get a little Florida weather? Yeah, you know what? That's a great venue down at the Seminole Hard Rock. Um, it'll be nice to have a crowd and, and sell tickets and and have the crowd back in there. It's almost a little surreal commentating and watching the fights with with no noise. With you know, they they've actually had to pipe in some noise, so it wasn't so strange. Yeah, it is weird. It's, it's so weird to like because I know like when you're commentating, you're you're commentating with enthusiasm, but they can hear you in the arena, which is so bizarre because it's so quiet yeah. in there. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, well, Randy, thank you as always for the time. Obviously, uh, enjoy the show tomorrow night. Of course, I'll be watching. Obviously, we got next week with the finals in the uh, the women's division and, and, and the light heavyweight. So obviously look forward to that one as well. And then playoffs start in August. I'm sure we'll catch up again this season. But thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, I appreciate you doing this. Pleasure, man. Thanks for having me on.